My name is Sean DeGracia. I'm an elementary music teacher, and I'm seeking my master's in curriculum and instruction. Because of a difficult first couple years of teaching, I have an interesting relationship with PowerPoint. So let me illustrate a little of that for you with a, well, PowerPoint. I'm educating the world's future leaders. Half human, half machine, but all teacher. That's me teaching the class. But I'm here in the back, ready to pounce on the misbehavior. <clears throat> in a loving, professional, not physically abusive way, this is my origin story. I try to make some high production value stuff happen up front while I teach from amongst the students. I'm not advocating for every teacher to adopt my style. I'm just saying that seven years of teaching this way has led me to more fruitful ways to use presentation software, and I'd like to share some with you. An article by Jonathan Carr and Yue, 1998, called Digital Media for Presentation Purposes, Hypermedia, and were ahead of their time in stating that this type of program, today's PowerPoint, Keynote, Google Slides, would be very effective because students and teachers could not previously produce media at will to express their ideas. And such programs would be better used not to replace lecturers, but for students to use for presenting to other students and learn the concepts presented more deeply. We have the magic mirror from fairy tales of old. It lets us see and hear whatever we want to see in 16 by 9 aspect ratio with 4K resolution, depending on how nice your projector is. We'll probably carry a magic mirror with us into a bathroom at some point today. So if we can see and hear anything we want, why should we have to see and hear this? Sean Topic. Too many bullet points. Too many bullet points. Too many bullet points. Too many. The principle of relevance, according to Kostlin in 2007, would have me put up as much information as needed, not too much or too little, depending on the audience. I used to think discipline management was putting kids in their place for reacting badly to what we subject them to, kind of like that terrible slide. It was new for me to think of my students as my customers or even my audience. Actually, they're more than that. They might even be my doctor or lawyer someday, and they'll remember whether I broadened horizons or shot them down with bullet points. So thinking of my reluctant colleagues, I thought a step-by-step -step from lesson plan to high-quality slide would be beneficial, and it would benefit my future doctors and lawyers because those teachers would teach their students how to do the slides, and then the students would in turn be teaching each other. People in general, and students especially, have come to be aficionados of good visuals. Since you're already making slides, you can apply some basic graphic design principles with the help of my PowerPoint slide tools and course. These slides will engage students better and for longer than other slide designs would, which can increase participation and also get them excited about the content. You could assign the vocabulary list to your class, for example, and each could make a slide for homework and send you the PNGs. Once teachers are done with that, they can look at how to get better quality audio into PowerPoint. Numerator, the number above the line that indicates the number of parts taken. According to Calyuga 2012, instructional presentations may not be sufficient for efficient learning in realistic settings. For this, the learners also need to allocate their working memory resources to dealing with cognitive load by being actively engaged and motivated. Engaged and motivated really stood out to me. During the in-person version of my training, because I geared it toward novices at PowerPoint and or graphic design, I had colleagues who finished early with beautiful slides. I mean, beautiful slides. My gifted group needed some more activities, so I taught them how to get high-quality narration into PowerPoint using their phones. As much as I love PowerPoint, the sound quality of record slideshow function leaves much to be desired, and that might impede the user's artistic voice. Throughout this process, I witnessed my colleagues who were my students that day finding their respective voices, once in creating the graphic and twice during their voiceover, combining in a way greater than the sum of the parts. This had to be the best use of PowerPoint ever, and maybe there was more to this. What they made were short digital stories, minus the music part.
which are defined as narratives read over moving or still pictures accompanied by sounds and or music. They were digital storytelling, so I googled fulfillment and motivation for which Maslow's hierarchy of needs came up. So for my literature review, I thought I should bet it all on digital storytelling meeting most of Maslow's needs because of the looks on the faces of my colleagues, the quality of their slides and voiceover, past digital stories which left me in tears, and the known power of story itself. By examining how it meets those needs, we can tailor DST assignments to be the most suitable to our students' needs. Maslow's paper on motivation, 1943, is very often quoted in articles concerning pedagogy and eudaimonia, in other words, the good life. The basic needs are survival, which includes food, clothing, and shelter, then safety, which includes a steady home life with routines and limited exposure to dangerous things which may harm the individual. The higher needs are love, then self-esteem, then self-actualization. The third need, which is love, includes familial, platonic, and romantic love, and comes with a sense of belonging to one's peer group. Self-esteem refers to belief in oneself and a perceived evaluation of oneself, most of the time positive. Self-actualization, in the 1943 paper, refers to a person living out his or her full potential, a very rare trait Maslow attributes only to great historical figures like Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, and Eleanor Roosevelt. In a later paper, however, Maslow, 1961, lets self-actualization be at least closely related to identity and flow states, which will be discussed later. Digital storytelling, which will be further referred to as DST, satisfies or in the least begins to satisfy Maslow's needs more comprehensively than previously asserted in scholarly journals. So what it means to us is that if we figure out how it satisfies those needs, we can motivate students better and we can make assignments that can help fulfill the needs that they have. DST perceptibly addresses Maslow's hierarchy of needs, excluding the first. Unless the students make a career of DST, Maslow's first need of survival, which involves sustenance and clothing, will not be addressed. But the second basic need, safety, is addressed with very promising results. Okay, actually, now that I think about it, every time I rehearse this, I imagine a soup kitchen with computers and microphones and allowing homeless people to do DST and improve their lives, I guess. But maybe that's something for another project. So Maslow 1943, page 24, writes that if children are exposed to a stressful home life with a lack of structure or decent treatment, and also if they lack an outlet to express themselves, the basic needs will not be met and thus delay or prevent the fulfillment of the higher order needs. Safety is not merely the condition of being free from harm, but just as importantly, the perception and feeling of being safe. DST has been used successfully, even more successfully than writing alone, Anderson and Wallace 2015, in treating children with post-traumatic stress disorder caused by domestic violence. As the name of the disorder states, the trauma is past, but the stress stays with the person which causes him or her to feel unsafe. Overwhelming feelings of fear and anxiety can cause the sufferer to lose his or her sense of personal narrative. Memories tend to be scattered and disconnected, so writing traumatic events in a chronological order is therapeutic. Due to a lack of verbal and writing skills, the manipulation of digital media helps participants find their respective voices. So writing in itself is already an amazing thing, but there's something about the media aspect, according to a couple of these articles that I've read, that makes it easier for patients because it gives them a sense of detachment from the story a little bit, but yet they're still reflecting on what happened. So what does that look like for us? Well, here's an application and outcome. Counselor assigns DS to victim of bullying after situation is dealt with. Outcome. Student voices out and processes feelings, then feels safer at school. The idea of the third need, love and acceptance, being met, came to me because of a blog post I read. Readers found the stories amusing and sometimes heartbreaking. I was encouraged. I began to see that my life did count. People seemed to get something, perhaps even occasional wisdom, from my writing. Writers Alliance of Gainesville, 2019. The above quote may be if used in a collection of qualitative data could be used to consider writing and eventually DST, activities which foster a sense of love and belonging amongst one's peers, and possibly strangers. I too have that experience. Upon receiving feedback from my peers after sharing a DS, and I also feel a certain affinity towards and camaraderie with those whose stories I consume. 
whether I agree with their point of view, opinions, or choices made. Well, what does that look like for us as teachers? A teacher could assign a digital story about an embarrassing moment to a class of strangers. The outcome? The group becomes more accepting of peers as they are immersed in stories. I taught in elementary schools where they were children of rival gangs. They brought two schools together that were failing so that only one would be failing. And I think digital storytelling could bring a class together, even if they wouldn't have been getting along too well before. The fourth need met is self-esteem, which is addressed by DST in its ability to measurably increase academic performance and add new skills to participants' repertoires. The PTSD study by Anderson and Wallace, quoted earlier, for its fulfilling of the second hierarchical need of safety, shows results of 11 out of 15 participants showing an average of 17 points increased in self-esteem on their questionnaire instrument. The remaining four from 11 out of 15 showing no increase because their base self-esteem level began at the average. According to Actus and Yurt, 2017, results show DS has a positive effect on academic achievement and according to Dejunta, Alessandri, Gerbino, Canacri, Ufiano, and Caprara, 2013 studies show academic achievement contributes to self-esteem, which seems like a no-brainer, but this is research and we have to cover our bases. There's also a positive correlation between self-esteem and self-efficacy. Does that mean for us? Teacher of remedial writing class assigns DS. An outcome, students are less reluctant to practice and they receive a marked improvement in writing. Let's start with the hard stuff, where my APA citation looks like this. That TEDx Radio Hour mentions the brain having limited bits it can process at once, so becoming immersed in many elements of a creative work like emotion, processing of pitch, text, etc., can cause a person to stop processing his own problems and consciousness, literally losing oneself. I think Eminem talks about this too in one of his songs. The results of Insu Kim, eh, from, from earlier, DST seems to lend itself to flow because of its many elements. A person viewing a DS could experience flow, and a person editing audio and visuals for his or her DS, in addition to reflecting on his or her personal narrative, could create an even higher likelihood of a flow experience. All right, now for the mushy stuff. A contestant on the Moth Radio Hour podcast, a show in which people tell a true autobiographical story at the end of an extensive editing process, expresses quite poignantly and profoundly his thoughts on the preparation of his story in this quote. The more you learn about how to tell a story, and the more you learn about your own story, the more you learn about yourself, your own experience, and how you perceive the world, and how you, you perceive your friends and your family, and why you didn't forgive that person that you should have, and how you didn't punch out that guy that you should have. The experience made my story explode in slow motion, so I could see every little part of it. The quote above definitely sounds like a peak experience, as described by Maslow. Listening to the person from the above quote recite his story, one can hear a definitiveness in his view of the type of person he was, and what and who he currently considers important. As I recorded and re-listened to my DS on my difficult experience with my first teaching position, I experienced a kind of clarity in which I could see my thoughts, methods, intentions, past and present very clearly in such a way that I often draw on the realizations attached to that DST experience when making decisions at work and think about what kind of teacher, even what kind of person I want to be before interacting with my future lawyers and doctors. It's about the students. So speaking of students, what does that look like for us? Well, here's an application. Science teacher assigns DS about an interesting experience which includes a scientific explanation of an important detail. An outcome. Students flow with the scientific concept and will probably remember it for life. So I won't do the bad British accent again, but don't forget about our magic mirrors. We can produce media at will. We're curators of this stuff. We don't have to be encyclopedias because today's students think we're pronouncing wiki the wrong way. We can use our powers for good. So remember to insert your story and not bullet points here.